Hello everyone, welcome to the 1100 Project with me, Stuart White. Uh, today we're joined by a special guest, so this is a special edition of the podcast, so you don't have to listen to me monologue for 40 minutes. Instead, uh, we're going to chat to someone who knows a lot more about the industry and self-publishing than I do, uh, who uh, has sold half a million copies of her books, who yesterday just announced her first adult uh, book as well so she's going to be debuting in that category too um, and she's basically trying to take over the whole publishing <laughs> world uh, so today we're joined by Maz Evans how are you doing Maz? Hello Stu I'm good if I'm trying to take over the world it's like the worst villain <laughs> superplot ever like I am failing you know really badly no sort of top of the empire state building type monologuing for me I've barely made it out of changing room so it's, it's a nice idea Oh, it's, but it's, it's honestly, it's so good to have you on. Um, I was, I, I was half expecting um, that. You know, usually when you ask people for podcasts, oh, I'm so busy, blah, blah blah. But you were like so enthusiastic and so positive when I asked you, and I'm, I'm really grateful that you can come oh, on and chat I to me. Love you. You know, I love you. <laughs> Although every day is a school day, isn't it? And we learn in this career all of the time. And certainly, the thing I've learned today is just check whether the podcast is audio or video as well. And I've literally just been for a run. This is real sweats, sitting here, no makeup, sweaty head. So yeah, just check the brief. But when you enthusiastically agreed to us, I thought, yeah, I'll go for a run. I can do it stinking. I've got my banana smoothie here. Like, do we didn't check a thing. So my apologies to your regular uh, viewers. That I look like an absolute hag. <laughs> I tell you what, though that 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 uh, that little bit there will probably get people to switch from the audio to the video. <laughs> I don't think so. Don't think... do it. If you're considering it, don't do it. This is our <laughs> warning. Don't. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, you've just drawn attention to it now. How <laughs> what do you do? Frankly, yeah. I was like forty-three years old I'm drawing attention to myself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think you look great anyway. So oh, um, you beaming, do. beaming with endorphins from your run. <laughs> No, that's not endorphins. That's just a little sweat. But it's viral. Oh dear, yeah. Um, and it's a good thing we've got video actually because um, you, we're going to do a little bit of visual stuff as well um, as we're we're chatting about um, when you self published, um, which was which was quite a while ago now. Yeah, I'm, I always get the time frame a little bit wrong with this because the, Who Let the Gods Out was published in 2017. I think, and I should know this for sure. Um, I think I self-published Who Let the Gods Out 2015 from memory. I sort of decided to do it 2014, but it was 2015. I actually kind of brought brought the book out. Um, so, you know, it was a, another good two years. It might have been 2014, though. <laughs> <It was laughs> around there sometimes. No, but I could probably tell you because I did actually do a paper. So, yeah, so I was, I was, I, was, I told you earlier on, I was reading up on you last night um, and it was 2014, yeah. Um, and yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think you... Was it 2015 you signed with Chicken House? Or? It was, that's it. Yes, that's yes, what it yeah. was. Because actually it was quite, I had quite a long publication pregnancy because yeah, yeah. originally Who Let the Gods Out was supposed to come out in the summer of 2016. Uh, but when they got a whiff, they thought it might do all right. They, they bumped it to sort of the, you know, the, the A-list slot in February 2017, which at the time, it's like being eight months pregnant and then being told that your baby's not coming for another year. <laughs> it was so bad. I was like, no! But it turned out it was a good thing, but... Oh, it was a long two years. That was a long, long, long two years, I tell you. Uh, do, do you still generally wait that long for books now? or It's quite weird now because I'm sort of in the sausage factory. You've mm. always got sort of, it really messes with your, your internal sort of chronometer being an author because like the book I'm, I'm editing literally today is out in September 2023. It is presently October 2022. And then the book I've got coming out in May next year, I wrote back in January 2021 or something. So I, I constantly, so when it's something like Christmas shopping, I get completely confused because I, I start thinking, oh my God, I've got to book my holiday next year. It's like, no, you don't, it's October. Like you're absolutely fine. But everything I'm working on at the moment is for summer next year. So um, it does still, because everything's all, publishing is either, glacial so it's either you are waiting and waiting and waiting so like the announcement of um over my dead body that the new adult book yesterday i've been waiting for I mean, june july august september october, five months for that announcement and it's taken forever and then suddenly yesterday you know they land the copy edits on me and need them next week <laughs> it's like publishing is like publishing is like small children it's either way too quick or way too slow there is no normal speed it's like walking yeah. 
toddler. You know, they're either running ahead or dragging behind. And <laughs> you can't actually ever just get a normal, comfortable ambulance pace. But I'm, I'm sort of finding my way with it after these, these many years. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, yeah, it's, I, I guess then when when you're in the midst of it, it's quite nice because you might be struggling along slogging through one book, but then obviously a new one has been published and that gives you maybe the energy. And... It does actually. And I have to, I'm really struggling with this edit a bit and the announcement yesterday and it had the most wonderful reaction online and it's kind of like, yes, this does have a point. <laughs> I remember now there is a reason that I put myself through this fresh hell. It's, it's like exercising and then, you know, you fit in the dress or you fit in the suit and you go, oh, that's why I, you know, got really sweaty running down Bournemouth Beach you know for a while so it's it's just remembering the end point sometimes it's good to remind you why yeah why you go through the process yeah yeah okay so let, let's go all the way back to the beginning mass um mm-hmm. back when you were called uh, Mary and you, or, or I don't know were you still called Mary when you first started um for I, your publishing? I, I I self-published God's as Mary but the funny mm-hmm. thing is well, that Mary is my, my legal name Nobody yeah. uses it. Literally nobody uses it. So unless basically something legal or deeply medically unpleasant is about to happen to me, <laughs> I don't tend to hear the name Mary. But obviously I've always been Maz. Uh, yeah, I was Maz at school and I'm Maz to my family. So I've always been Maz. So um when but obviously I thought, yeah, this is a proper legal thing, I better be Mary. And when Chicken House signed who let the gods out, they basically went, don't know how to put this, you know, delicately, but really boring name. I'm like, <laughs> like, I've got to talk to my mum, you know, there's not much I can really do about it. So we had this, the first of many surreal conversations I've had in publishing about, well, we need to change your name, we need to make it something a bit punchier. And one of the suggestions was, they said, well, what's your star sign? I said, well, I'm a Gemini. They said, well, let's publish you as Gemini. Well, like, great if you're an adult entertainer. <laughs> I'm not sure. So good for a children's author, like Gemini. It's like a gladiator, isn't it? Oh, like, it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Of cotton buds, you know, it's that sort of thing. So um, we were going round and round in this just surreal conversation about what to call me that I wasn't actually called. And I said, well, I, because it's such a like, it's like you being Stu. I'm sure I don't really think of it as a nickname because it's what everyone calls me. So I went, oh, well, I mean, people call me Mads, but and they're like, oh, you know, oh, that's it. And I was like, oh, right. That was easy then. So uh yes, I sort of was Mary back then, but yeah, we have been. So do do you have a copy of that uh, that very first cover with with the Mary on it, or well, you I, can, then? I can go back further than that. Actually, okay. so I originally wrote um the just excitingly titled Elliot and the Immortal uh way back in 2009 and as i always say when i told her i did two very stupid things in 2009 one i turned 30 uh which was a terrible error of judgment and two i had my second baby in two years no i'm sorry i already had the second baby i was pregnant with my third baby in three years uh my three younger children are boom 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 uh yeah. and i was sort of going slightly out my other two children were two and one and i was pregnant with number three and i was going out of my mind you know Stu, you know, mm-hmm. young children are a blessing they're a joy they're a miracle but oh, god they're hard work <laughs> they're, they're not they're not conducive for productivity or oh, creativity no, the pram in the hall is the enemy of creativity i mean a pram is like <laughs> the lego the stickle breaks the screaming and um i hadn't really been able to talk this is i've been a journalist and obviously in 2008 uh, the absolute bum fell out of journalism as it did with everyone. Just gone freelance and self-employed to say, "Oh, I can work and have children. I can have it all." And <laughs> 2008 comes. In. <laughs> um, so I wasn't really. And it, I was at that glorious point that working parents can find themselves at that I realised it would actually cost me money to go to work. So I would actually be paying more in childcare than I would be yielding uh, in income. So um, I was at home with the kids, and I, you know massive respect to full-time stay-at-home parents I will never ever hear a word said against them because it was the hardest time the hardest job I've ever had and I was a bit children glorious but my days and I just needed to use my brain so I sort of I don't really know where it came from I kind of I I remember sitting in front of bargain hunt and suddenly this idea just came into my head randomly that just went huh if the Greek gods were immortal they'd still be alive today huh and uh, and that was it 
And so when the kids were asleep, you know, the 2.4 picoseconds a day when all, both of my toddlers were asleep, um, I just sat and wrote this book and I loved it because it was just after a long time of Weetabix and snot and wet wipes, it was just a sort of creative outlet. And I wrote it, I wrote Elliot and the Immortals. And obviously the, the, I wanted to get it conventionally published because why wouldn't you? Uh, and I was already represented. I had an agent as a script writer because that was the, the first career I failed at. Uh, I was I wanted to be a TV script writer. So I was repped by David Hyam Associates already. So I thought, well, I've got one agent. Like, obviously, this is going to give me another one because that's how easy it is. And um, they and it went to Veronique Baxter. And uh, that was a wait. Oh, God, that was a wait. And a refresh, refresh, refresh. Um, and eventually she got back and sent me, you know, looking at it now, the loveliest, most positive, you know, constructive rejection imaginable at the time <laughs> it was like dagger in my heart and I of all the rejections I've had and and there have been many that was the one that really hurt actually because I was I sound really stupid I was convinced this book would change my life I was at, just had this surety of belief not out of arrogance because I'm actually d despite appearances I'm not a very confident person so it wasn't like a well I'm great you know of course I'm going to be punished it was like I genuinely think this book's really good and I think kids would enjoy it. Um, but obviously my own agency wouldn't take it on. And they passed it around. So was Veronique was like, oh, it's nearly there, but it's just not quite, but I'm going to show it to a couple of colleagues. And then they came back and said, yeah, we like it, but we don't love it. You know, that rejection. And um, so I very uh, maturely went into a complete strop for five years <laughs> and shoved it in a drawer and went off and pursued another career in academia. I did nothing, but it was when I um, was working as a creative writing lecturer at Bournemouth University and kind of working with other people's creativity every day, sort of two things happened. One, it reminded me how much I love it and how much it's just an essential part of me. And I had not yet kind of you know, quite scratched that itch and it was still there and it wasn't going away anytime. And I decided I was going to be an academic. I was on track I was uh, to do a PhD. I'd got a scholarship to do a PhD. I was going to go down that road, but it was still kind of like, oh man, <laughs> it was still there. So um, the other thing that teaching creative writing taught me, though, was the massive importance of form and structure and plot, uh, because I've always been able to write, you know, nice, funny characters and, and you know, sparkly bits of dialogue. But actually, I realized what my book lacked. And I would say this to the vast majority of people I've mentored or tutored or worked with. The, the biggest note I tend to give is where's the narrative tug? What is where is the engine that is pulling this story along? It's not enough to write a lot of really prettily formatted words. There's got to be, you know, a path through this that we want to follow. And I think that's where my writing really fell down was that I didn't have a good enough grasp of plot. And of course, all writers will say, you know, this is more important, that's more important. But for me, that was the thing I needed to learn. So do endlessly giving the note, but why should we care? You know, what does this person want? What's going to happen here? I can't see where this is headed. You know, doing that ad infinitum, you suddenly go, oh, <laughs> okay, thinking about it. Um, so I went back to Elliot yeah, and the Immortals. And um, by this one, I was also sort of slightly moonlighting doing um, creative writing workshops in schools. And I just thought, well, I got a minute. I've got a route to market here, which is super important with, uh, I'm sure Colin will talk about this. And I thought, I've, I did, I'm in front of hundreds of kids doing this thing. They don't care whether you published or self-published or they don't know, you know, it doesn't matter to them at all. They wouldn't know what the difference between the two. Um, and yeah, we get on well. And I can sort of see as a sort of business opportunity here. And just at this point, I'm about, what, 35. And I just want to hold the damn thing in my hands. Yeah, I just want to hold a book with my name in it. So this was sort of the test one that I did on one of those, like, I think it was this Lulu, I might have done this one on. Um, yeah. but just to kind of get a sort of, you know, idea of it. But then I decided to do it properly and, you know, really researched it. And uh, this was then uh, the one that I produced. So I got the brilliant Mark Beach, who was uh, not such a well-known illustrator then, otherwise I never would have been able to afford him, frankly, uh, to do these fantastic, like, you know, Quentin Blake-esque illustrations uh, on yeah. it. And I learned all about the various stages of the process. That looks amazing. Well, it, I'm not, it's not bad, is it, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We first go and again I'm sure we'll talk about the nuts and bolts but I started like my own um kind of imprint story stew which is you know the company through which I, I run my, my author business now anyway but you know bought my own ISBNs really learned to do it from the ground up and then basically ordered 2,000 of them which landed in my house that was a moment <laughs> I sort of I really think what 2,000 books might look like <laughs> it's a lot it's very big and my then husband kind of looking because he was like where are we going to keep these I'm like 
loft. <laughs> He's like, you are kidding. It's <laughs> like you know, 50 boxes up and down the stairs. I was no wonder our marriage didn't survive. Uh, but he, um, so we you know, had this house, just, we had books everywhere. <laughs> like we were using them as furniture. Were everywhere. Um, and then every time I'd go and do a school visit, I'd take my books and, you know, might sell one, might sell a hundred and what have you. And from that, um, I then um, sort of d- was doing that quite happily. And, you know, again, I'm sure we're going to show making good money at it mm-hmm. as well. I mean, you know, when you put in the big prose column of self-publishing, it's obviously the money you can make from it. So um, did that. And then my script writing agent, the original agent, Nikki at David Hyam, just sort of did her regular, where are you? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, um, oh, sorry, I'm not been in touch, but I've been busy, you know, going around doing this with this book I've written, you let the gods out. She said, oh, she said, have you sold any? I said, yeah, it's about two and a half thousand. <laughs> And she, the phone rang and that went, what? Uh, she said, well, have you considered getting it traditionally published? I went, uh-huh. And she, because I think my colleague, Veronique Baxter, would really like to read it. And I thought, oh, go on, then I'll play. And so I went, oh, what do you think? Oh, all right. Um, so I sent it to Veronique, who, of course, had read Elliot and the Immortals and, and rejected it. And um, she got Who Let the Gods Out. I mean, I sent it to her about nine o'clock on Monday morning. I think I heard from her about four o'clock that afternoon. And she went, I love it. I, I'd sell this in the New York Minute. And I was like, really? <laughs> and obviously I had rewritten it between these two points. But I think the, own, and, it, and if you compare the two, they're not wildly different, but I just think I've nailed the plotting in this yeah. one. And um, and she, we, we had a meeting and, and sadly the day we were supposed to meet, uh, my sainted grandmother, who I was very lucky to keep till I was 36 years old, died that day. And so I had to cancel the meeting. And I always sort of, um, rather than, you know, we, we rearranged and we, and obviously she took me on. And um, I was sort of rather think my grandma had a hand in this because I'm from a family of mathematical geniuses and scientists and engineers. I'm like the weird freakoid, you know, words person, the complete black sheep. And uh, my grandma was the only other one who had any interest in books and writing. And I was, it's a nice little between these two things so yes so that was it and then uh veronique took it on off we went to chicken house and uh, the rest is you know very low grade uninteresting <laughs> <laughs> yeah because i mean that's the thing over over the last what is it it's been what, seven years or so since since that that point um obviously you you become quite an established um name and is you know in, in, the, in the children's industry certainly um i know that you're very popular among schools um and until the pandemic you were doing lots and lots of visits with them as well yeah, yeah. um is that something you think that grew out of the foundations of story stew and, uh, and the work that you did then without a doubt and and without a doubt it's it's why gods has got its feet under the table i mean you say i'm popular in schools it's very generous <laughs> but who let the gods out of course ties in very neatly with the key stage two ancient Greece topic uh, and teachers and educators have just been amazing to me. They've been so supportive of me and my books and, you know, every new term, I kind of see my sales go Vroom! <laughs> like, thank you, education. Uh, so, you know, much as I'd love to claim it is the brilliance of my, you know, prose and characterization, little bit of a happy uh, kind of symbiosis there, but um, definitely going around hawking my wares was extremely good preparation because when I'm when I you know do these conversations about self and traditional publishing the thing that strikes me is is not differences actually but it's the similarities and I sort of have this fanciful notion that I think a lot of people do that you know you get a publishing contract and you get a publisher and you get a team of people around you who do all this stuff for you and you know whatever one's opinion on it that's not what happens you know you have your little period of post-publication stuff and then honestly you're kind of on your own and uh, I'm glad I'd had that experience with stories to you because I didn't have any great nervousness about going out there and selling my books which is important and the first couple of years Gods was out and it got you know it had all the breaks it could get because it was Waterstones Children's Book of the Month which is a rocket launcher uh, for a little great career and um, but still you know it's those years I spent on the road that that I'm sure kind of laid the foundations but it's a difficult one because it worked, but you know, at huge personal expense in every sense. And it's it's difficult to say it worked, but I have to say it's not a path I would recommend because it took it, it took a really massive toll on my life and my finances and my family and everything. So it's kind of it's not like I say, Yeah, get out there and spend, you know, four days a week on the road, because it, it sort of 
that there are trade-offs that I, I wouldn't make again perhaps but um yeah, but yeah, yeah definitely that self-published kind of grifting <laughs> essentially yeah. kind of taught me a lot that was that's been very useful in my traditionally published career yeah because I think a lot of people would look at you and and maybe you know like read the interviews that you've done and see your sort of your career path and so on with writing and, and would think oh if I just self-publish and sell 2,500 copies I can be like Maz Evans um I and say straight away I should be like Maz Evans is not an ambition <laughs> I would recommend to anybody on any level, personally, professionally. In fact, probably complete opposite too would be a great place. Like, I'm just not going to be like Maz Evans would be a good way to start. But yeah, it's, I, I wish it were that simple, that just mm. use A plus B and C happens. I mean, I'm an extremely rare example, I think, of somebody who with the same title has gone from self-publishing to traditional publishing. You might know better than I. I, In fact, I can't actually name anyone else who's done it. I'm sure people have. There's a few in the adult space, but very few, like none that I know in the kids' space. You know, like Andy Weir, who did The Martian, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, yeah, he did yeah. it in the adult. Yeah, yeah. because a lot of people the Wattpad, that kind of yeah, know, that's right. fanfic route, don't they, and going that way. But so yeah. it, it's weird because I talk about this a lot, but again, I feel like I'm, I'm slight snake oil salesman because I'm not, recommending it necessarily as the way forward because certainly what I was told was if you self-publish a book that's it you've kind of you've played your hand and you have it. what it can do is give you um you know sales data to take to a publisher with another project but uh, which sort of was kind of in the back of my mind I guess um but the fact that it you know I was very fortunate the same title got picked up and and taken on by Chicken House which I, I don't think that's very common but um yeah but uh, yeah, like to the point, I can't, I can't think of someone else who's done it. But I'd be really interested to, to hear from anyone else who has mm-hmm. them, you know, compare experiences. Yeah, it's so interesting that you say, you know, about the the personal um, cost, you know, not and not just in terms of expenses, but in, in every other way. Because I guess I, that's just, it's it's the same at every stage. I think of a, an author's life where people see the tip of the iceberg. You know, the book been published and you smiling on social media and holding the book, but they don't see the toil and the labour and the expense that's gone into that. And I think it's it's interesting. We're going through a moment at the moment. It might be because it's royalty season and we all go, what? (laughs) How much for all that work? So I've had a lot of, this is not to depress anybody, but I think it is important people are aware of the financial and, and emotional and practical realities of life as an author that... Um, I mean, I had to become a best-selling author to be as broke as I have ever been. And, you know, I say that flippantly, but genuinely, I mean, I did not get a big advance for Who Let the Gods Out. Um, And it's, you know, and the the mechanics, I mean, I I have this conversation with a lot. The whole system needs to be sorted out because my big, you know, rant at the moment is that publishing can keep talking about inclusion and diversity all at once, but it will never truly be inclusive until people can afford to do it because we know that if if money is involved you know the sector of people you're going to get and we know that anything involves money disproportionately disadvantages certain communities in certain sectors so it's you know it's a nonsense to kind of have schemes that promote inclusion and diversity if you're not going to pay people properly and the whole thing needs root and branch systemic change that's my soapbox I will now descend <laughs> and from it. Um, but it is a ridiculous system that you know for instance I mean I didn't know this when so your advance for example I thought well your advance is like a sale price so you know your publisher is paying x for this no your advance is a payday loan you know you are mortgaging your future book sales so um you know I don't mind telling people that I was advanced seven and a half thousand pounds for who let the gods out now that comes in three bits so two and a half thousand pounds on signature two and a half thousand pounds on a delivery of the matter of a a, you know a publishable manuscript and two and a half thousand pounds on uh publication so as we've said between signature and publication there's two years straight away so I got two thousand five hundred pounds 2015 2500 2016 and 2500 2017 now i don't want to be privileged or bourgeois but i don't think i'm speaking way out of turn when i say two and a half grand a year is not any sort of income for 
anything you know it's like it doesn't pay you money and um you know I was going around doing visits and what have you but you know I wasn't I'm in the fortunate position I could command a better fee now but I couldn't then and you've got train fares and you've got your dinner and you've got cups of tea and you know bags of crisps and it's just the money and also of course what I wasn't doing when I'm on the road is doing the job I'm actually paid for you know at that moment which was being a you know, journalist and a lecturer so it's there is a very harsh financial reality and I'm I realized the other day and again I don't say this to be arrogant but there was a statistic the other day 98% of books sell fewer than 10,000 copies which just feel always go oh now I'm in the very privileged position most of my books all but my newest books have all sold over that number and so that puts me in the top two percent of this profession technically I'm sure it doesn't by other metrics but let's just go with it so if you think if you're in the top two percent of most professions the money you'd be earning and I look at my royalties and again in author terms I'm very very fortunate with my royalties I'm in the tens of thousands of pounds bracket but if you put what I earn from royalties in another career path it's like okay I earn less than most teachers say from from the sales of my books and I keep having to have very difficult conversations. I've had one this week where, you know, a bookshop 150 miles from where I live said, um, please come. There's a school that's desperate to have you uh, and we'll sell the books. And they've promised you 50, 60 book sales. And you have to say to them, but you're 150 miles away. So you're a day, possibly a night away. Um, I'm going to make from that, if they do 50, 60 books, which is a respectful sale, I'm going to make less than 20 pounds in royalties, which, by the way, I won't see for another year, um, whilst... You know, paying for a tank of petrol, possibly a premier in, and not being at home and childcare and all of those things. The booksellers and booksellers aren't coining it in either, but they're making, you know, maybe two, maybe as much as three pounds a book. I'm making 30 pence out of a book. And yeah. you know, people need to understand that we cannot work for free and book sales. And there's this very dangerous, I think, toxic gratitude curve in publishing where people go, because so many people want to do it, aren't you lucky? You're so lucky to have a seat at the table that you should be grateful because if you weren't doing it, thousands of people would want it. It's like, okay, yeah, they'd want it, but they're not here. <laughs> I am, and I've worked to be here, and I'm good at what I do, and I work hard, and I deserve, like anyone doing a job, to be paid for that. That's not, I have no... Yeah, I, there are things I elect to do for charity. There are things I elect to do because I think there's a good social imperative for me to do them. I live a life of privilege and I'm happy to pay that forward. But I can't do any of those things if I you know, can't afford to pay my own bills. And you know, the number of conversations I'm having with authors, particularly at the moment, who are these are best selling authors these are authors again you look out on social media doing the ah, and they don't know how they're going to pay the gas bill they don't know how they're going to pay the mortgage you know they don't know if they're going to have a house in six months time and it's so i'm bringing the tone down a bit here it's great, no, no. It's great. <laughs> but it is it's important people know that and it's important yeah. that publishing sits up and takes note because you know it's it's got to change it's got to change yeah. I know it's, it's it's so difficult. Um, I know I've got a lot of friends who who are you know not not in that, those top two, so they're in the ninety eight percent. Um, and are, I know, and there, and there's so many factors in it. For example, some of them have said they have been um they have been given no sort of advice or training or anything on anything yeah. to do with the job of being an author. So they deliver the manuscript, but outside of that, no one's sort of saying you you could be doing X Y Z to try yeah. and sort of raise awareness of your book. You could be doing you know. <laughs> Um, and and that's well, something how it works. I think there's a huge sort of veil of secrecy over publishing and just literally how the thing works, what the mechanics of publishing are, what an advance means, what returns are, what um, and I think again, having been a self-published author, I had an advantage because of course I had on a very small scale run my own publishing business. So I did have some small level of insight. But even so, like I was very grateful to one of my publishers, Hachette, um, who published the Exploding Life of Scarlet Five series. They actually did when I signed up with them, and bearing in mind I, you know, I was a, a fairly established author by that point they did send like a manual that explained all of this stuff and I learned having been in the business about five years already you know I learned a lot from that and I know Chicken House my, you know, my publishers of the Gods and Vice Vice series they do actually give their authors like media training and event training so they can go and do school visits and stuff because yeah. you've got to look at all the other ways because the the reality is for the vast majority of us and I like I say even here if I am indeed in the top two percent even here there's no way I could live off my book sales alone uh, just it wouldn't 
it wouldn't be sufficient to you know fund fund a lot and that's not even a good like you know i'm an aldi girl this is not and then look at me look at me look at the state of me Stu. it's not like you know i'm living some very you know very fine i do live a life of privilege but you know i'm not sort of, this is not to finance my private yacht this is literally <laughs> shopping for foie gras uh, yeah, waitrose. Yeah, this is literally this is my kids love all the knock my knockoff aldi love i'm absolutely like you're not having real shreddies have malted wheaties they're just the same <laughs> Uh, so just just to bring it back then to, to touch on that note but also to bring it back to self-publishing and um, when you were self-publishing and selling your books you know by hand literally I mean I, I was reading one of your your interviews that you did at the time and you said that it was something like all bar basically a couple of hundred of your books you sold physically by going in and giving yeah, yeah. the books to kids yeah yeah um i mean i did have it i learned how to put it on amazon i'm quite impressed with 2014 maz actually because do that you know Stu, you of all people know what a technophobe i am i'm like do can you help me how do books come in um so how i did it i don't know and you've just done it i mean you know getting a book on amazon like you need a phd in coding it, it's so complicated but i did all that but the reality is yeah 99.9 percent .9 of all those books I, I put in people's hands and that's why when people talk about self-publishing, particularly in children's, because what you have to remember with children's, the reason self-publishing tends to work for adults is because of the massive Kindle market that you have. And that when people have triumphed of self-published authors as adults, I bet, I'm going to even stick around and say all of them have triumphed uh, digitally. This is not a print phenomenon that has, you know, brought them into traditional publishing. Now, still to this day, it I find it so fascinating. Children will do anything on a screen apart from read. Ebooks still remain a minuscule, minuscule market. Um, I mean, you know, uh, Who Let the Gods Out alone in this country has sold about 150,000 copies uh, physically um, through TCM. So that's the, that's the other thing people don't say, the difference is sold in and sold through. So my publishers have sold in, like got out of their warehouses, like 400,000 copies of this book, but sold through is what's gone through the tills. So big difference between someone sold in numbers and sold through numbers. So we all like using sold in numbers because they sound much better. Uh, but who that the gods has sold through about 150,000 copies physically. Ebooks, I still think it's probably in the very, very, very low thousands. And by low, I mean like, two or three i mean it's so low and that's for a best-selling book you know that's still doing all right six years after publication so well, because there's, there's no a, there's, i was just going to say there's a statistic um from uh, nielsen i think it was or i can't remember who where i got it from but 96 percent of middle grade books are sold in paperback and only four percent in ebook yeah see that that doesn't surprise me i mean it's it is just know from my own experience it is tiny you know almost yeah. negligible the ebook market for children so which is fascinating because they're such you know digital consumers but yep. no reading mm, doesn't doesn't seem to appeal so um that kind of takes for the self-published author that avenue away and also also you can't market to children online or you should not be marketing to children online so it's all about physical copies so you know you've got to be at festivals and in schools and doing all of those things and because you know, Stuart won't surprise you work together and, uh, and become very warm acquaintances because I'm quite gobby um I did manage to get myself into the festivals but I think it's important and this is an important piece of advice for anyone like I say and I can only really talk about children self-publishing because I don't have experience of adult self-publishing but you've got to have actually I'd say this for any author you've got to have your shtick so it's not good enough if you want PR or marketing or events to go hi I'm an author and I've written a book because hey guess what that was everybody else. So you've got to have, you know, an, an angle for want of a better word. And there might be something about you that makes you of interest to a festival. So you represent an underrepresented community or you've got a particular life story that is going to be fascinating to tell. I have none of those things. I am a white, straight, middle-aged cisgender woman. So no, boring, dull, boring. Um, so for me, I had to sort of find another way. And my thing was, I thought, well, what you know, what can I do? I'm like, oh, no, I can teach creative writing. That is something I have experience of doing. I've been running stories to workshops. And so that was my thing. So I didn't pitch to festivals, hey, take me because, you know, I'll give you a great event. I said, I can do workshops. And they were like, yes, 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 please come do it. So, and because that was the other thing I was told as a self published author, you'll never get into festivals. And I did because I offered them something that they wanted. And you've got to remember, and I'm going to be talking about this a lot, uh, starting this new 
Creative Writing School, as you know, uh, which is going to start in January now. But um, I, I'm going to be talking about the business of being an author a lot because we need to stop seeing ourselves as airy fairy hobbyists. And remember, when you do this, either self-published or this way, you are running a business. You have a product you are taking to market and you need to apply the same principles to these, even though they're lovely and we love them and they're books and it's happy and it's children. No, it's a product that you're taking to market. So you've got to find ways to sell it. And one of the you know, key rules of selling anything is what do people want? Uh, and with the festivals, it was very much, and, and with schools to start off with, it's like, I'm not, what schools don't like is feeling like you're just setting up shop in their school, quite rightly, because particularly in these times, you're asking parents for money, it's very, very difficult. So what are you offering? What are you bringing to the table for those? And I think that's so important as a self-published author. Why should you get a spot you know and it's not just because my book's great well everyone thinks their book's great you know that's that's not it what's it what is your usp what can you offer that nobody else can or that you can do better than everybody else or that you only you can do and i think it's really important to identify that and for me it was like i can teach any kid to write a story a statistic I still, I'm delighted to say I have a clean sheet after all these years, even the most reluctant kid who would rather stick the pencil in their ear than put it to paper I can get a story out of. And that was, yeah, that was kind of how it all got started for me because I, I identified my route to market and the USP, what I could sell in and yeah, mm -hmm. got breaks that you, you might not otherwise expect as a self-published author. So it's just being, it's just having business now, you know, it's, and I can't stress that enough for anybody, you know, embarking on this in either direction, how important that is. Yeah. And it's interesting because you, you, you kind of, the way you went at it early on was you went at it with a, a sort of double sales strategy. So you would get yourself booked to do the workshops. So you're getting paid for doing the actual workshops and, and then you're yeah. also selling the books and, you know, and then it becomes a reasonably profitable, you know, day if you're going okay. and you're selling uh, you're getting two, three hundred quid for your workshop, and you're you're selling you know a hundred, hundred and fifty books. Exactly. On which, of course, because I did buy them in bulk back then, and, and don't count on these figures now because a lot has changed since I did this. But my per unit cost was eighty p for the books. Um, obviously, the first print run had some cost to work off, so I had you know, the illustrations and the um, you know the, the proofreader and the copy, edit, all of those kind of the editing things. So I had, I think it cost me two thousand pounds to produce this book so obviously you know a, a fair chunk of them just went to wiping its face but once I'd done that I am um, the books were ATP a unit and I'd sell them for a fiver which is obviously a very happy sales point for you know a, a parent you know, a yeah. fiver in your pocket so you know I was making four pounds twenty per book four oh my god I, I'm literally having a visceral like why did you stop <laughs> So, you know you sell you know and I, I did 50 100 books I would be leaving with like 400 quid in cash in my little pink tin and it was you know it was and like you say and then I was at 300 quid on for a day to be there so it wasn't unusual that for a day so I could walk away with seven eight hundred quid and that's you know I've massive absolutely massive and you don't need to do too many of those but you're exactly right and that was key to the strategy that's why um my first husband He's now my very, very, very best friend and co-parent. Yeah, he's a marketing man. And, and when I sort of pitched this to him and he went, but that's genius. He said, you're getting paid to promote your own products. I said, well, yeah, that's it. That's exactly it. Um, and, you know, I have extremely strong views, as you've probably gathered about creatives working for free. I have real problems with promotional tours uh, that are sort of put this. Isn't it wonderful because we're going to sell all of these books? It's like it's a week of unpaid work. And, you know, you should be being paid, even if it's just I, I, I have a rule. I, I put this on Twitter the other day, actually. That I said, I now refuse to be the only unpaid adult in a room. If the reason that room is there is to come and see me, that's kind of, yeah, the number of times that I, you know, there's a publicist there who's being paid. All the educators in the room are being paid. You know, the person putting the chairs out is being paid. And I'm standing there. You know, these tickets have been sold or whatever it is, and I'm not earning anything. And it's just... It's, it's not greed it's just basic value and worth you know it's too it's too hard and too demanding for us not to get paid for what we do and every time I talk about this on Twitter there's at least two or three or four or five I'm afraid usually teachers who come forward and go but you should just want to inspire children it's like you can want to inspire children 
and need to eat. You know, both things yeah. can be true at the same time. <laughs> Those same teachers wouldn't uh, want to go and inspire children every day for free either. Well, I have to bite my tongue on that <laughs> exact retort. Go, go on then, you could inspire them every day for free. Wouldn't that be fun? You know, and it, and it is, I mean, and what we charge, when you look at an author visit, I can see, it, I, I, I charge top dollar now because I can't afford to do that many of them because I've got three kids and it's you know, being away from home but they look as like you go you get how much for half a day and you go okay but there's quite often the day's travel to get there so actually from the point of me leaving my home to the point of me coming back might be two days so you spread it out over two days it doesn't look so good I can't do them every day so it's not like I'm earning that every day I might only do 10 of those a term um, yeah. because I do actually need to you know write the damn things uh and uh do all the other bits that come with being although i'm not selling a sob story you know i i am well paid for the school visit so i wouldn't claim anything other but when you kind of um amortize it over you know a term so you know you look at sort of 450 pounds for a school visit and you go oh my god but i can only do 10 of them a term so that's four and a half grand over four months well when you look at that a thousand pounds a month still not not knocking it but it's not you know like it's not the yacht you know and it's yeah uh, um, and and there's so many factors as well because the 450 isn't just about you doing the session it's about everything that entails you know the preparation the travel yeah. like the disruption to your normal routine in your life and so on it's um, I think the emails with the, t- with the teachers before yes. you know, to, to sort it out and make sure we're on the same page and, and sorting out the book selling and sorting out and I say like, I'm not giving a sob story because I'm not saying I'm not well paid for this particular aspect of my work and if you look at it on like an hourly rate it's obscene but it is that it's also the preparation for it it's also usually the two days of being sick after you've done it um and there's the fact that yeah it takes you away from your writing so um it's you know it, it's there's more than just you know when when I, and obviously if i'm just going to a school down the road i'm not going to charge them the same as if i'm traveling to lincolnshire because it's it's a different thing i can nip over and do it but when you you know i've had schools recently that some schools wanted to come to liverpool and they wanted sort of a knockdown rate and i just i looked at what it was going to be and it turned out it was going to be like a hundred pounds per morning and I, I would again that sounds like a huge amount of money but given that it's two days out and that takes up then four of the slots because I can't just go off to Liverpool every day I have I'm a working mum I have three kids at home um you know you, you sort of, it makes you really sad and it sounds so capitalist and it sounds so greedy but it's just you know and I'm very fortunate in what I earn as an author but even as an author like so you, you stick that in another profession it's not terribly spectacular and it's, it's really important to be aware of that I think because I think people come into I know I was speaking to an author who broke my heart the other day they um got a, a, a sort of good book deal a few years back and there was a lot of excitement about these books and I think just uh, frankly due to the pandemic they didn't do what they might otherwise have done and I'm afraid publishing is brutal you know so this person's been told well it didn't do what it did we're not renewing your contract tough this person had given up their job and they've gone all in on this and of course because they were relying on doing school visits stuff like that and they've they've just had to go and get another job and they're, they're heartbroken I mean it's literally publishing has taken them chewed them up and spat them back out through absolutely no fault of their own or their book or their talent or their hard work or their determination or their business nows and that's yeah, yeah it's it's hard it's re- and every time yeah. i have i've been really grumpy this week about editing my new novel i'm really not enjoying it i go i don't want to do it i hate this job and then he talks and you go and we'll just check our privilege shall we man let's, yeah. let's just ground ourselves back remember yes Lucky to be. but but that honestly that story that you or that um that point of view that you've got is is it's a common one um yeah. almost everyone who's an author feels similarly um and and, and you, you you're lucky because um you have been doing it a while now and you've got a lot more experience and you've got more of a a voice i guess to you know in a platform to sort of speak back i guess <laughs> but for but for a debut author it can be quite intimidating no, and hard to say something anybody. i don't care now i'm just, I'm, just I'm, <laughs> like, I'm, like, I'm like the irascible old auntie who like goes oh yeah auntie maz is off we'll give her a gin you know calm her down a bit but um i don't want to i have these conversations with them i don't i don't say something you know publicly that i don't say to them privately and <laughs> actually a lot of them agree with a lot of the points i'm making but they've got to like no one in publishing is oh that's not true i don't like that narrative actually. no one in publishing is making any money have a little look at some of the profit margins and some of the big publishers someone's yeah. making some money let me tell you but it's um it's really hard and there's that it is the toxic gratitude curve that you've sort of got to you know tuck your forelock and be grateful for it and you can be very grateful for it because part of it is luck you know it's kind of i mean the story i told about who let the gods out 
didn't sell in 2009 and it's a bestseller in 2017 same book you know so yeah. timing and luck and who you come up against all of those things obviously play a factor it's not meritocratic it's not the best people get, get their books published and go on to do well sadly it's not nearly as fair as that and who what's the best book anyway that would you know, vary on who who was reading it but I yeah I, I do sort of speak up about these things and I speak up about how crap it can be sometimes because I don't think it's right to it's I think it's unhealthy and it's toxic to perpetuate this and obviously I put the good bits on Twitter but I also sometimes say I had a really sucky day today and I hate this and it's crap and I don't want to do it and because it's it's important that we also quietly have these conversations in in corridors and I think it's important for new writers that they know what's coming up and that it's okay. You know, you will have bad days, good days. The highs and lows are very, it, you have to be quite resilient because that, the highs are euphoric and then the lows are crashing. And I said before we came on, you know, I, I, I really notice how index linked to my mental and emotional health my publishing career is. You know, things are going well. I'm, you know, on the home front, puzzle front, I'm great. And when they're not, I have to really stave off kind of anxiety and depression and things like that. And I, I have yet to successfully, you know, entirely separate the wheat from the chaff. But it's important, you know, it is a wheel and it turns. Yeah. And, you know, it, when you're going like that, it feels awful. But you do have to remember it, it does come up the other way as well because it is a brilliant career you know I wouldn't do it if it wasn't and I you know, for, <laughs> I just feel like I'm a bit negative I'm sorry for everything I've said you know I do love it and I feel immensely privileged to do it and be able to you know the children's aspect of my career because I have two now students don't have to mention adult book coming up uh but you know I, I had a gig on Monday where I opened a school library and they're joy at books and stories and talking to an author and you know um school visits are very important I think because festivals and things reach a certain demographic um of, of families that will take their children to literary festivals but schools of course are a little bit more egalitarian so you can um you know meet lots of children who might not otherwise have access to author events and things like that um so it is it is glorious <laughs> to make that very clear I do love my job I'm very yeah. sorry <laughs> Oh, honestly, I, I'd really, I'd, I'd love to talk to you, to, I've got so much more to ask you and I'd love to talk to you for a lot more time, but um, I'm conscious that we're coming to the end of the running time for the for the episode. So can I just finish off um, and ask you to uh, give a top, maybe a top two or three tips for anyone thinking about self-publishing? Absolutely can. So the absolute first one would be buy your own ISBNs. Don't go through a third party publisher because why, why would you? Because it's they're just going to a take some of your money. You don't have the kind of um, imprimatur of being your own publishing company. So I don't know what they are these days. When I bought mine, you have to buy in packs of 10 or 100. Again, I'm assuming this, forgive me if this information isn't entirely up to date but i think still through uh, nielsen isbn's coming yeah packs of 10 or 100 they're about 160 quid are they now 150 160 quid something like that um which sounds expensive but you get 10 of them don't forget you need an isbn for every version of your book so you need a different one for the print book if you're going to do an ebook and also if you do the two different types of ebook if you do epub and mobi you need two different isbns for those if i remember correctly uh, and an audio so you can easily use four or five in in one title so Definitely, definitely get your own ISBNs and start your own publishing company because I think A, it, it looks better. But B, for you, I think then it's yours and you are treating it like a business. Two, treat it like a business. You are. This isn't a hobby. You know, you need to have projections, realistic projections for sales. And don't think all your friends will buy one because they won't. Um, you know, be realistic about what you can afford. The other reason, in fact, this would be my third piece of advice. Do not under any circumstances use a hybrid publishing model these people who act like they're an actual publishing house but they're just going to take your money and do things you could do yourself I don't I I only hear horror stories from them and these people of course they'll sell you your own dream back to you so you know if you pay five thousand pounds ten thousand pounds, we're gonna make your book a better well no that's not how publishing works you should never if you're not self-publishing you never pay a publisher that's not they pay you uh, it never ever works the other way around so don't use a hybrid model because I that tank is full of sharks um and I think four, you asked for two, obviously it's me, so I've <laughs> four, I talk too much. Um, be realistic, you know, don't go, as I don't assume your friends and family are going to buy one, don't think you're going to sell 300 at a school event. You know, if you're selling 30 at a school event, you're doing ever so well. So keep your numbers realistic. And it's like gambling, for God's sake, 
do not spend what you can't afford to lose. You kiss that money goodbye and you assume you're never, ever, ever going to see a penny of it ever again. Please God, hopefully you will and it will come back to you and then some. But only spend what you can afford to lose because it's very easy with our own vanity to get a bit carried away. So so I, so I to finance goals, I say it costs about two grand wrong gods to uh, do that i taught night classes for a year prior to so this was money that didn't come out of my family didn't come out of our holidays didn't come out of our anything i took on another night job just so that if i never saw this money again it hadn't hurt anybody else i loved <laughs> it was just my thing that i'd chosen to do and i financed it and i would really recommend that keep church and state very separate that way and just save up for it whatever way you can which is not easy and kiss it goodbye for Hopefully you'll see it again. But then if you don't, you don't add a load of guilt and horror into all of it as well. So, yeah, but but treat it like a business and do your research. That was about it. Oh, yes. No, th- th- that was amazing and perfect and actually so topical because the, the next episode I'm doing is to talk through business plans and setting up a business and finances um, and to talk about, uh, you know, how much I've spent and so on. So that is a perfect way to finish this one, I think. Well, I'm so pleased. It's a pleasure to talk to you. I'm sorry, Stu, if I've just gabbled on and not let you. No, know. no, that's that's what I wanted. I wanted no, to I hear from you. To say that. Could you say that to my fiance? Because this is the principle <laughs> based on to operate our forthcoming marriage on, and he's just not bored at all. <laughs> yeah. So it's been lovely to have you on, uh, Maz, and I'll speak to you again soon. I do hope so. Good luck to everyone. Bye.